Serving Gate Country is a four-year project, um, involves a number of key institutions. Um, that's the Australian War Memorial, the Department of Defence, Veterans Affairs, Australian National University, University of Newcastle, Catholic University. And it's a directive to chronicle the history, if you like, of um, Aboriginal involvement with the Australian military. The history from the Boer War right through to Afghanistan and Iraq today. Very few people understand or even know that Aboriginal men and women have served in every military campaign that this country's taken part in. So that's basically what the project is about. Um, a lot of community consultations. Um, we are going to every state and territory. Um, so um, going out, sitting down in communities, recording interviews. That's the part, I mean there's going to be a, a lot of archival libraries and archival institutions, research as well, but it's complemented by a lot of oral memories, either of their forebears or people that have actually served currently, or even, you know, certainly Vietnam. We've done a lot of interviews with people who have served in Vietnam. Looking at the history of it, looking at the archival record, speaking to um, um, forebears, you know, that uh, people with their forebears went and fought. Uh, there, the record sort of comes across that they went as well to fight for change back home, social and political change back home. They felt that going overseas and proving they were no different to white soldiers and they could fight just the same as them. And a lot of it was recognised that Aboriginal men were the best horsemen, they were the best shots, um, they could track anybody. So they had all these capabilities that were held up. So um, they wanted to prove that they were, you know, the equal of anyone else. And once they'd done that, they felt that the change would come back at home. Sadly, on their return, that did not happen. Um, a lot of men, you know, came back from Gallipoli, the Western Front, the Middle East, and found that their kids had been removed from their wives' care and they'd been institutionalised and they couldn't get them back. A lot came back. The soldier settlement scheme had been set up for returned soldiers to work a, a block of land somewhere. Blackfellas went along and they were told, oh, it doesn't apply to you. And we know that there's some, some did get land. There was one Aboriginal man from Ivanhoe in Western New South Wales, a Kennedy, he, he did get land. And there's a couple more that have surfaced since. And around the country, I've just come back from South Australia and there is evidence of people actually getting a little bit of land as well. But when you consider the amount of people that actually fought, they were very rare that anyone got any land in the soldier resettlement scheme. The other important point in regards to that is the land that was being handed over to white soldiers was actually Aboriginal land. And this is probably one of the most important points of Australian and Aboriginal history is the point from 1880, and I'm talking about New South Wales here, through to say 1910. Very few people, black or white, realise and understand that Aboriginal people had fought back and regained a lot of land in New South Wales. They'd written petitions, in some instances they'd had help to write letters and petitions, in some instances they wrote their own and they sent them into the government demanding land, which was always in their own country. So if you were Dungati, it was Dungati land, Waramai, it was you know, Waramai land. Wherever you were, they were fighting for land within their own country and they regained a lot of land. The Protection Board records classify the land as worthless, heavily timbered scrub. Useless. Give it to them. So they gave it to them. There were no managers on these places, like the heavily congested reserves of the 30s, which is the memories that most of our people carry. On these particular reserves, we'll call them, although they were independent farms is the better way to look at it, there were one and two families. Now, this heavily timbered, worthless scrub, they cleared it, they fenced it, they planted crops, they built homesteads, they had livestock. Lots of evidence in the archives, they were clearing 110 pounds, 120 pounds, 130 pounds annually. That's a lot of money at that particular time period. They were winning blue ribbons in the agricultural shows right across the state, prospering. There's one record there that I've got of an Aboriginal family. They'd built a nice homestead. They even had a piano. They were affluent, you know, in regards to that. And I've also told, you, Josh, before about Jimmy Doyle from Nambucca Heads, an Aboriginal man, actually Gary Foley's great-grandfather, who had five homes, a boat-building enterprise, and added investments in war bonds during World War I, who they said his wealth ran into four figures. All of this stuff was torn away from these Aboriginal um, people from about 1910. 
accelerated in World War I with the soldier resettlement scheme, a lot of that land being torn away and handed over to white soldiers, and also the pressures of whites, white farmers. They wanted the land that was already cleared and already cropped and already fenced and was prospering. Aboriginal people were thrown off this land. The figures are something like 27,000 acres of Aboriginal land was, was, we were turned off from with nothing more than the shirts on our backs and with no recompense whatsoever for you know, three and four decades of, of labour. It's also recognised before the turn into the 20th century that somewhere between 84% of Aboriginal people in New South Wales were self-sufficient. That's an amazing situation. And also with the World War I records, all of the soldiers, Aboriginal soldiers, I'm talking again about New South Wales, they were all employed. You know, they, yes, they were shearers, they were labourers and they were stockmen, but there were lots of other things. There was a plumber, there was a butcher, there was a student, there was a musician. There was people in all of these sorts of jobs that joined the military, Aboriginal men, not recognised. So you can say that there's all these stuff about our oh, Aboriginal people are already on handouts. You know, they were getting blankets and flour and sugar and some tea and they were under control. They weren't. <laughs> they were all employed, they were prospering. If we'd been left alone, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in in the 21st century, realistically. Our people were prospering. No one knew the, the land better, no one, no one knew the seasons better than Aboriginal people.